Hello, and welcome to the Drexel Interview. I'm your host, Paula Morantz Cohen, and today our guest is Derek Gilman, Executive Director and President of the Barnes Foundation. Dr. Gilman has come to the Barnes after serving as Director of the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts in Philadelphia. Derek Gilman, welcome to the Drexel Interview. Thank you very much. Before we talk a bit about your plans for the Barnes, I wonder if we could talk about your background, your training, um, the work you've done before you came here. Um, you were educated at Oxford in England. Um, your degree was in philosophy and psychology, I believe, and then you did work in Chinese studies and you have a law degree. Um, you became interested at some point in art history and art education. When did that happen in this mix of various disciplines? Sounds, well, the, the saying that I had the degree in philosophy and psychology makes it sound uh, both very grand, um, if one likes philosophy and psychology, but also um, it makes it sound as if I actually achieved what I'd set out to achieve when I was 15, but it didn't work like that. I actually did a year of philosophy and psychology and then switched to Chinese studies. Uh -huh. And in that switch, I was, very, I was a very errant student, and I went home to my parents and said, you know, I want to go to art school. Mm. And they sort of rotated me around 180 degrees and put me back on the train and sent me back. And uh, there was actually, my father was quite nice. He said, you can go to art school afterwards. And I thought about this, and I, I thought about doing architecture. But then when you said you wanted to go to art school, did you want to be an artist? I wanted to be an artist, mm. yeah. I mean, I'd always painted, so, every, you know, so I had time. So I said, well, I can't be an artist. I'll do architecture, because you know, I was sort of OK at sort of maths. And, and I, that seemed to be the obvious thing to do. And it was one of those things that people had been telling me out to do for ages, mm -hmm. which I hadn't listened to. And I discovered, of course, then that Oxford was the only university in the country where you couldn't do architecture. So I looked around, and I had a friend who was doing Chinese studies, so I did Chinese studies. But one of the reasons I did it was because I could both do Chinese philosophy, and I did enjoy the philosophy part of um, what I'd studied, and I could do Chinese painting. Mm -hmm. So that was how I got into art history. So it was a a little hop, skip, and a jump. Okay, and the law degree was the that law a degree was I think that was much later. That was mm -hmm. when I was running the university museum, the University of Dambia. Okay. And uh, I'd been much inspired by a great guy who sadly died um, in 2005, called Steve Weil, who was deputy director of the Hirshhorn and the sort of doyen of museum lawyers. And through um, coming to contact with Steve. I became absolutely fascinated with the idea of, you know, the boundaries and the rules around institutions, and and I decided I really ought to explore this through a a law degree. Bernard Watson, who is chairman of the Barnes Board of Directors, has noted that you have been an effective leader of three important institutions on three continents over the past two decades. The first job was as a curator of the British Museum. Then you became director of the Sainsbury Center for Visual Arts at the University of East Anglia. And then the deputy director of the National Gallery of Victoria in Melbourne, Australia. And finally, here in Philadelphia, director of the Pennsylvania Academy of the Arts. Now that is quite a career, quite an expanse of space. Could you tell us a little bit about how these various jobs uh, have prepared you? to take over now as executive director of the Barnes? Uh, I, I think they, <coughs> I don't think there was any sense of, of planning um, to be prepared. I think they have prepared me in, in a curious way. But you know, there are lots of really good people in the world who say, you know, long term, I'm going to be director of the Barnes, and this is how I'm going to become it. I just. Um, I, I, I wouldn't say it w wasn't a case of following a star. I followed, you know, almost instinct. And um, curiously, the conflation of my interests you know, seems to have um, been propitious for the Barnes because I think that the, the, the time when I was at the British Museum, when which was really the last time I did Chinese art you know, seriously as a as, as a, um, were you as a, a curator researcher. of I was, Chinese I was, art? I was, yeah. I was a curator in the British Museum, mm -hmm. and I was. Um, we focused on Chinese art from the 10th century onwards. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was, that was the point where 
And remember, I'd, you know, I'd done, done my degree in China. I'd been, spent a year in China uh, during it was the end of the Cultural Revolution. So I was pretty you know, immersed in the culture. And I came to the British Museum, which was still very much Eurocentric. And I, I mean, that, was the, that was a very good experience, not so much curatorially, which it was, but it also to get a sense of you know, being an outsider within the Europe, uh, European art history. I'm mm -hmm. actually married to a European art historian, but, <laughs> but you know, we used to rail in, in, in Orient Antiquities, our, the department of the British Museum, against the Eurocentric view in the oh. museum at large, which I, you know, I think has very much changed over the 20 years since I left. Um, but at the time, in the early 80s, you, know, you really felt that you were, it was just culturally, you, know, you were sitting in London and there was Asia over there. Mm. And you felt culturally that the same thing had been going. This was the core history was here and Asian history was over there. So being a curator there, you were sort of on the periphery or you were not in the mainstream of what was going on, but that might have been a, a good I think it was uh, a great thing. I think, you know, it experience. wasn't that you weren't in the mainstream in terms of activity. You were just deemed, it wasn't deemed to be, you know, um, at the heart of what was important in the world, you know, which is... So I think that's, you know, when you, you know, talking forward, all the way forward to the Barnes, and you think back to the battles that people like Barnes and many others fought in the early 20th century for the primacy of non-Western culture, mm -hmm. and he was a great collector of African art. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you as, an, on a, as an original non-Western art historian, one's very sympathetic to that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went to Melbourne, uh, which has one of the great collections of old masters, and it was a very, very wealthy museum between the wars. It was massively well endowed, and that was a time when you could buy great paintings were coming up in Europe. Um, <coughs> and it was, that was interesting for me um, because it was an expansion of my own experience. I ended up, I think, looking after, in terms of supervising collections, pretty well every area of art in the world without necessarily knowing much about mm -hmm. it, but actually being responsible for it. And uh, so, you know, I was very, very occupied at the time with the two new buildings we were doing. One was a, 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 re a, a remaking of the main um, gallery and the creation of a new gallery for Australian art, um, but also focusing very much on the display of these very important collections of Western painting and, wi and working with some of the artists um, whom I you know, hadn't yet worked with. But the interesting thing was that in the middle of that, between the British Museum and Australia, there was this period at the Sainsbury Centre Mm. And the Sainsbury collection is in some, it was in some ways the real preparation for the Barnes. I don't know if you know the Menil collection in Houston, which no is a great idea. collection formed by the de Menils, which is uh, a wonderful non-Western art, um, wonderful surrealist art and modern art. The Sainsbury collection was started earlier than the Menil collection, and it's, it's slightly smaller, but it has had great modern Western paintings and great African sculpture and... Native American and Pacific sculpture. And the way in which it was displayed was very much the way that the Barnes was displayed because mm. Bob Sainsbury, who started collecting in 1933, was very much influenced by you know, older friends like Jacob Epstein, who were absolutely of Barnes's generation. Mm. So the sensibility of the Sainsbury collection was just the same as the sensibility That's of the Barnes collection. And the way in which it was displayed was in that, what we call that high modernist taste. So, you know, Bob and Lisa Sainsbury, they gave the collection to the University of East Anglia in, um, in 1974, I think, and the building was built in 78. And when it was put up, it was displayed the way it had been in their house. So you had a Picasso drawing with an African mask next to it, mm -hmm. and then there would be a section of antiquities over there with you know, New Island masks from um, Melanesia in next door. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, coming to the Barnes and seeing it for the first time, as I did in late 99, it all felt terribly familiar. So the Barnes way of displaying art, which I thought was particular to, to Albert Barnes, is actually part of what you call the high modernist style? It was pretty style. common. Yeah, I think it, it was, was common? I didn't It was common that. amongst the avant-garde, mm -hmm. and, and Barnes was very early on. The Sainsbury collection is really almost a generation later, because Barnes started collecting in 1912. Mm -hmm. So Bob was... Bob started collecting when he was 26 in 1932, 1933. Um, but he was, he was Henry Moore's first major patron. So mm -hmm. he made his own contribution in a very different way. But as I say that um, in Paris and in London, um, but not really in America, because that's where Barnes was a pioneer. 
mm. there were artists and there were collectors who were doing that very Barnesian thing. They were the great discovery of, this, of the great discovery which which was characteristic um, of the early 20th century was that you could you could admire, you could collect, you could show art which was outside the European mainstream, what we were talking about with Chinese mm. art. And the, one of the major components of that was the, was the, the sort of discovery and appropriation of, of uh, tribal art in the very early years of the century. And there's an argument by various people about who discovered it, as it were. Epstein, who was an American sculptor, mm -hmm. New York sculptor who went to England, claimed to have been the first person to have gone to the um, uh, great ethnographic collections in Paris and, and made the connection. And then Durand, I think, I think it was Durand. It was either Durand, it might have been Picasso, it might have been Matisse, but there was a whole argument between, right. you know, I saw it first, no, I saw it first. So you're no. saying these, who, was the, who were the first primitivists or yeah. who took they on that? They, were they, did they call themselves that? Or no, we call, we've, we've, we've used that name yeah. later. And they weren't the first, actually, mm -hmm. because, again, this is a movement that goes, what jumps back in the 19th century. There's never these clear markers. You know, we say mm -hmm. modernism really begins with Les Demoiselles d'Avignon in 1907. No, it doesn't. You know, we say, no, it began with Van Gogh and Cezanne and Gauguin. Mm. No, it didn't. It really began with Monet. No, mm. it was Manet. And, and you, you end up going, it you back. keep on pushing yeah. it back. And yeah. you sort of end up with, with Corot and, and um, you know, Courbet. So, but the, clearly in the 19th century, there were these series of movements like the arts and crafts movement in England. Um, and then Gauguin going to Tahiti and, uh, and actually making his own carvings, his own versions of, of Tahitian sculpture. Mm. And they're all precursors of this. So it's not as if there was some great revelation. It's just that a lot of, a lot of people argued around who really discovered it, and that, it's part of myth-making. Right, right. But certainly there was a, there was a, there was a, there was a, um, a number of people who were taking things which were not Western and displaying them alongside you know, mainstream Western art in the I early guess part that, of the century. that is so particular to what I think of as the Barnes collection, uh, the way in which it's displayed, as right. well as the fact that, of course, he did collect African art, tribal right. art, but juxtaposing so many mm. different styles is, is, is so, uh, I haven't seen it elsewhere, it's interesting right. to know it does exist. But I wonder if we could move on and talk a bit more about Albert Barnes mm -hmm. himself and uh, his vision, his background, what caused him to do the collecting, and then I hope we can talk a little bit about what's going on now sure. with the collection. Tell me about uh, Albert Barnes, what made him, I mean he certainly, he was a businessman, Am I he not mistaken? Well, what made him become interested in He was a businessman who was, he was a, he, he was a, he was a man who um, doesn't feel at all uh, foreign to our, to the contemporary period. And I think somebody who was not uncommon in probably the history of America. He was actually a doctor. Uh, he trained, he, Central High here, then to Penn, mm. medical degree, um, studied uh, chemistry in, in Heidelberg. A, he had a period where he was a, actually a gambler as well. You know, this mm. is before, and he, revolved, he turned into a businessman. He, was a, he saw an opening in the market for, um, for you know, antiseptic products, which were the, you know, the precursors of antibiotics. And he, like a number of people, he saw that silver nitrate was, had real possibilities for medical use because they, they were good for certain skin conditions and medical conditions, but they were corrosive. And his great innovation with this um, German partner was to work out how to um, form an, um, a, uh, an alloy of, um, or a, a, a synthesis of two substances which would enable you to use silver nitrate and not corrode skin. It was called, and he, it was um, trademarked as Argerol, and he made millions out of it. Mm -hmm. It was so that came, was the money, the, was the money. Argerol yeah. portion that yes. made it possible yes. for him to be. But he kept on looking for other things, and you know, the really interesting thing is he bought, he was, he, he, he had this attitude, which was the attitude that, that made him really successful with Argerol, which he applied to other things. So, you know, he, when he was building um, on what's now the Barnes property, he was also developing land around. And he was always conscious of how much it cost and how to um, how to offset his costs. It was he was applying his that business mentality. 